<laughs> yeah, good morning. Good morning. Beautiful day. Okay, check out this. There's a little bit of sushi, bread, some yogurts, and that kind of thing. Getting a little skinny back there, but go check it out before you leave. And um, there will be no men's, I mean, uh, on Saturday at 7 a.m., there's a men's Bible study. Um, all men are welcome. And um, then the alternative baby bottles. I understand there's people that forgot to bring them back. <laughs> if you, you got one more, you got another chance, bring them back next Sunday. Um, full of money, checks, cash, anything you want to stick in there for them. It's all, will all be appreciated. So if you have forgotten your baby bottle again, bring it, you got another chance this next, um, this next Sunday. And there will be no discipleship classes this month on Sunday evening. So we'll find out what's going on with that. It'll get started up next month, I'm sure. <laughs> so um, good to see you. Amen. Let's worship. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your gift. Father, may we honor you this day as we do communion, as we worship and sing praises to you. Mm. Thank you, Father. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Larry. Bro, we so appreciate that, buddy. This is the day the Lord has made. We're going to sing. Uh, this is a great hymn, great, great old hymn. Come thou fount of every blessing. God is the one who blesses us, meets our needs, above and beyond our expectations, worthy of our faithfulness. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing offer songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melody sonnet sung by flaming tongues of love. Praise the now I'm fixed upon It's a great, great verse found in first, or Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Do you pray for our country? Are you praying for our leaders even if you didn't vote for them? Okay. That's the call, right? We're to pray for those that God places in authority. And sometimes I say, Lord, I go, Lord, really? <laughs> you know, really? But who am I? So we pray for those, even if we are on uh, have different mindsets and different op opinions and positions. And we pray that the power of God might speak to their hearts and do what only our Lord can do. So guess what? If my people, who's that? That's us. If my people who are called by my name, and we recognize that we are, we, are, uh, we are the children of the living God. We are his children because of what Jesus our Savior has done. Christ the Lord is risen. We serve a risen Savior. How awesome is that? 
was near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise again Ten thousand years and then forevermore, forevermore. Oh, I will bless the Lord, oh, my soul, oh, my soul, worship his whole. R.C. Sproul wrote, if I am in Christ, it is because God took me out of the world and gave me to Christ. The only reason you exist and I exist is for him. I don't agree with everything R.C. says, but I sure agree with that. <laughs> in Christ alone, our hope is found. In Christ alone, my hope is found. Is my life, my strength, my soul, this cornerstone, this solid ground, broke through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled and striving cease, my comfort. in my life that every heartbeat I have it's a gift from him
hear your word. Father, I pray that we are courageous to receive it. Write it on our hearts, Father, because your word we hide in our hearts so that we might not sin against thee. Father, shape us and mold us. And throughout this week, as we face the challenges of life, may we face them, Father, always walking hand in hand with you, seeking your direction in all, we, in all that, uh, the ways that you would have us to go, the things you would have us to say, the attitudes you'd have us to correct, Lord, and the shaping and molding that you are doing in each and every one of our lives. And boy, I pray that for myself, Father. I know they get easily distracted. I pray, Father, that each of us, we would fix our eyes on you, the author and the finish of our faith, our Lord, our Savior, our Master, our friend, our all-powerful and loving God, our Father. We thank you now in the name of your dear Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Steve and Paco. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, welcome. Um, We're going to be uh, in Galatians some, and that's going to be on the slide here a moment. In a, in a moment, um, and we're also going to come to the Lord's table this morning after the message. So, just kind of set what we're going to do here in a moment. Catch on to the last thing that Jesus, or the last thing that Steve said as he was praying was he was calling the Lord by his different titles. And the last one that he said was, did you notice? Father. If you belong to Jesus, you're a child of God. Amen. If you don't belong to Jesus, you're not a child of God yet. And if you belong to the Lord, if you've given your life to Christ, Jesus calls you his brother, his sister. When I started coming across that and really thinking about it, that messed me up for a while. <laughs> because Jesus is my Lord and my God. Amen. I see myself more of standing there beside old doubting Thomas myself. <laughs> <laughs> to be amazed at those, those wounds. But it's important that we come to some understanding about God is our Father and the way that He loves us in an infinite way more than is necessary or required or desired of our, our earthly Father. The first thing I want to read you is what happened at the Lord's Supper. And the hour had come. This is uh, Luke 22. You needn't turn there just yet. Luke 22, 14, if you care to. When the hour had come, he, this is from all of eternity, Jesus has been aiming at this evening to have this last Passover with his precious disciples before he would go to the cross and die and pay for the sins sufficient sacrifice to pay for the sins of all the world but efficient to pay for the sins of those who would believe so reading from verse 14 of Luke 22 when the hour had come the 12 apostles with him sat down and he said to them I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer for I tell you I will never eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God and he took the cup. There were four cups involved. Four different toasts, if you will. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said to his disciples, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them and saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. But see the hand of him who betrays me is with me at the table. Indeed, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. They began to inquire among themselves which of them was it was who was to do this. And of course, we know that it 
where it turned out to be um, Judas Iscariot. And, uh, and with that, pausing for a moment to remember what day it is, uh, one thing that it is is we are now more than halfway through the year. And for some of us, we were lamenting a few minutes ago, is time is flying. It just seems like a few days ago, it was the first day of 2023, and here we are already over halfway finished with the year. But I think that's a function of, though, is how old you are, and now that I'm a little older, is, is each year is, like this year, is going to be 1 67th of my life. When I was five... That year was one-fifth of my life, so it was a bigger percentage of my life. I think that's part of it. But we live in a busy world, don't we? And, and, and things are happening and changing. And one of the things is, is uh, what we celebrate, you know, the, the, un the unity of the United States of America, the independence from uh, England, our, uh, what once upon a time considered themselves our mother country, I'm fond of saying, if you're a Read People magazine and those kind of things, let me just encourage you. Don't put a lot of stock in what the Royals do. And I'm not talking about the baseball team. <laughs> and, uh, as I, somebody wrote something in a smart aleck remark at some point, and it was, I stopped caring what the Royals did in, 19, in 1776. And I thought, That's a good policy. We just finished uh, last Sunday evening uh, what could have been longer and more thorough. I was a little bit hungry for more when we stopped. But we finished an uh, eight-lesson uh, discipleship time on uh, our Constitution. And the, one of the big things that you learn when you look at the Constitution is when they formed the Constitution and wrote it and hashed it out and were writing articles back and forth in the newspapers is, and, and letters to each other is the book that was quoted or the, uh, who was quoted the most. You know who that was? It was the Bible. Not even close. There wasn't even a close second anywhere. Is, is there a lot of biblical values that were placed in the Constitution of the United States? And, and it got a little more biblical as we went along because there were some very unbiblical things such as slavery that was going on when the country was founded. But one of them, one of the verses, this is important for you as a Christian, as a citizen of heaven, is it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. For you and me, what we're thinking of today, the yoke of slavery is bondage to sin but also bondage to someone. Are you in bondage to someone? And, uh, they had, 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 we talk about that a lot. Too. But why did Jesus say, why did Jesus die on the cross to pay for your sins and mine? It was to set us free from our sins. Okay, next is for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. In other words, just because you're free, don't use that as license to sin. And shall we sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. And that's Galatians 5.13. The first one was Galatians 5.1. And for those who remember, what have I taught you? What word happens in every epistle in the New Testament? It's a very important word. Usually it's not so important, but there's one of those in every epistle, and that's the word therefore. And in in Galatians, the book of Galatians, it is the book of freedom. It's the just, Romans, shall live, Galatians, by faith, Hebrews. So in Galatians, those two verses, and what we're going to read here again in a few minutes in Galatians, is it's about being free in Christ. Being free in Christ. And what our founding fathers saw is that applies to all of life, not just, not just. It's not just. It's not. It's not just kept at church. It's just we're to be free everywhere. We're supposed to be self-sustaining and and uh, 
and and support ourselves and all those kind of things to be independent. That word, that big word, independent. Now, as Christians, we are to be interdependent, to depend on one another to some degree, but we're supposed to be very dependent on Jesus. So we're not talking about independence from Jesus. He didn't set us free to be free from him. It's to be with him. And then next one is John Adams. This is one of his more famous quotes. It is, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other you can tell by the headlines and all the debates that have been going on through just about all of everybody's lifetime here is that we've been drifting away from that part, haven't we? Uh, some periods uh, more rapidly than others. But it didn't start with this president. By the way, what Steve was saying about praying for our leaders, is I say amen to that. Uh, I got my, my, my email reminder about praying for my president appeared on my screen this morning when I was putting the finishing touches on the message. And so, uh, I, and I encourage you that that's something to consider doing is to get on the presidential prayer team to always pray for it. And it doesn't, you don't just pray for, let's say, President Biden, but you pray for all the leaders, but but it's uh, the, the principle. Praying who for whoever's in the White House and for whatever reasons. All that said is ultimately we are dependent upon our Heavenly Father. And so we move on to our message today. Turn, if you haven't already turned there, Galatians 4. Galatians 4. And I'm going to be showing you those verses uh, beginning in verse 4 now. Galatians 4 beginning in verse 4. So go ahead and show us that first verse there. Oh yeah, that's right. As a... Uh, um, this is a kind of a sermon series within a sermon series, recall, is that we started it with uh, Father's Day and we, we, we did it again last week about, uh, about God is our Heavenly Father. And, and that uh, one of the things that we learned in uh, that the Father's responsibility on Father's Day we talked about is that we're, don't, we're, fathers, we're not supposed to just teach them how to know things about the Lord, but we're supposed to teach them how to, the, the requirement to know the Lord. And Jesus said, go ahead, in John uh, 17, uh, verse 3, and this is eternal life. As he's praying his great high priestly prayer, that they know thee, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Is that, uh, compared to that issue, if we don't get that right, is ultimately, it really doesn't matter how successful that we are in life. It, it, it doesn't much matter. Because if I miss that, I miss glory, I miss eternity with the Lord. It's the, the importance of knowing Him. And then, again, on the theme of Father's Day, and we're coming back to that again here in a moment, is, is that we know Him is, as our Father. Okay, next. Remember what I told you last Lord's Day is the New Testament. If we could summarize the whole Old Testament about what what new and what new and dramatic thing happened is we know the gospel right part of the gospel the good news is the revelation of the fatherhood of Jehovah the heavenly creator and that's what told uh, this guy J.I. Packer I'm kind of like what Steve said I don't agree with everything this guy said but he's, he says a lot of good things and I do encourage you to, to read this book Knowing God by J.I. Packer and you probably some of you know us notice that this sounds a lot like Knowing God personally, the discipleship packet that we try to get everyone to go through, not written by somebody that that, that loves J.I. Packer, but they both love Jesus. Yeah. And, uh, and 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 that's a theme here. Is it's been a theme the whole time I've been at Broadway is trying to get people to know the Lord. And try to get people to to not just hang on every word the preacher says. I, when I came, some of you, there's two or three here that were here when Pastor Foley was here, and he would let people get by with it a little bit about uh, people would hang on every word that he said, you know, and and uh, and, uh, and there were people that believed that Pastor Foley never sinned. And he, he, he didn't jump up and down and say, that's not true, like I do. Uh, and, I, and, 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 of course, people nowadays, when I say I, that I do sin, there's people, I actually get amens from some people. And some other people say, I know. No. I've, I've, I've known this scoundrel 23 years. I know. But, but the, the thing is, 
this, the, the theme of any Christian should be that we know the Lord and make him known to others. Amen. With me? Okay. All right. Next. Look at all the times, I showed you this before, all the times that Jesus refers to the Father, God the Father, Jehovah, as his Father in the New Testament. My goodness. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and Revelation. And next. Not only can we make that observation, but when Jesus comes out of the tomb on Resurrection Sunday, one of the important things that he says to people, he's telling to the women, the first group of women that he sees, he'll look what he says. After he's talked to them for a moment, he says, but go to my there's that word, <laughs> brothers. The, ugh. Yes. But Jesus is my Lord, yes, but he is somehow, I need to get the, the idea, I need to get processes about that Jesus is inviting me into a brother and sister or brother-brother relationship. Mm -hmm. Go and tell my brothers. I mean, it's not just for those 12 disciples, but the others, uh, you and me. And tell them. I am ascending to my Father and your Father. Mm. And, your, and to my God and your God. And so, yes, we are still to see Jesus as our God. But he's our brother. That's God. And we're to see the Heavenly Father, Jehovah, as our God and our Father. And when Steve referred to God, when he was giving him <coughs> the titles and praising him in the prayer, is he was kind of taking us through the steps. And I promise you, I didn't pay him to say that. I didn't coordinate with him. It just came out of his mouth as natural as rain. And I just thought, oh my goodness, the Lord is, the Lord is so good. Let's go ahead. And last time we talked, and this is the four words that I stole from uh, J.I. Packer out of his book. And some of the Verses that I used that came out of there also. But as, the, as we worship the, our, our Father God as our Heavenly Father, that his, his ultimate authority over us, His wonderful affection toward us and ours toward Him, our fellowship, that is, we can talk to Him in prayer, commiserate with Him, repent to Him, ask Him for guidance, uh, and then honor, that we honor Him and worship Him. And He actually honors us too. Not to say not honor us in worship, but He does honor us. Okay? One thing for his presence and his attention, his guidance. And so here we are as uh, when it, it flat, fast forward now from Jesus standing outside or in Gethsemane somewhere, I'm sorry, or near the garden tomb somewhere, uh, out, just outside Jerusalem the day that he was resurrected. Fast forward to some years later when Paul writes very early in his ministry. Galatians is one of the first books that was written. And that became part of the New Testament. It says, But when the fullness of time came, that is, when it came time for Jesus to be born, God sent forth His Son, born from a woman, born under the law, that is, before grace, Jesus was born under the law, in accordance with the law, that is, the Old Testament, prophesying when He would come, verse 5, to redeem those who were under the law, that is, the Jews, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now, when he says redeem those that were under the law, it's those that are under the curse of the law. And, of course, you and I, or most of us here, we're not Jewish, so we, we, we're attracted to the gospel uh, not for, by necessarily culturally, right, through Judaism, but attracted to the law through perhaps our own culture, the way our parents are, uh, raised us, but primarily because... The remedy, capital R, for our sin, capital S. So that we might receive the adoption. There's that word. That, that you and I, as children of God, we're children of God by adoption. Jesus is not. Jesus is the monogenes, the only begotten. That's what, that's what that word means, is the only begotten, is that he is of the same essence of his Father. Not similar essence, same essence. 
you and I, we, as human beings, we were created and then gestated and born in the image of God, but we're not of the same essence as God. We are flesh and blood and spirit. And he says, and now because you are sons, God has sent forth into our hearts the spirit of his son. He's talking about the Holy Spirit as he indwells you. That's when you become a child of God. That's when you believe that Jesus really did. He really was who he said he was and he still is and he still lives and he still reigns. More than ever. And next. Crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a servant. Now, how many times have you been reading through the Bible and you see Christians, yourself, and even Paul as a servant of God? Almost every epistle that Paul writes, almost, I think, both times that Peter writes, James, they call themselves the servant of God, the servant of Jesus Christ. So, well, are we a servant or a son? And the answer is yes, but primarily we're sons and daughters. Primarily we are sons and daughters. Can you, can you internalize that with me? Because many of us in this room, I guarantee you somebody here, it's probably many somebodies, is we think of ourselves as a servant and a not very good servant at that. And yes, that's true. But what you need to understand is, is that, you know, part of that is you're aware that there's a gap between the you who you are and are being and doing right now versus who the Lord wants you to be and do, that is, his child who revels in his presence and lives with him and for him and from him all the time. We're no longer a servant. That is, don't think of yourself primarily as a servant. When you come across it in the Bible, uh, in the, uh, work with them there when they're giving you, teaching you a lesson. But always remember, when you close that Bible up and you get down on your knees in prayer, listen to me, you are a son of God. You're the daughter of the king. You are not a servant. I wish I had understood that thoroughly when I was 22, 23. Oh, I wish I had understood that. No longer a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So I want to give you a, 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 a very important sentence. You want to go find this in the Bible. But it's a very important sentence. I think it's worth writing down. You ready? You, you know that word. We're coming to the P word. Propitiation. Mm -hmm. Adoption. You and I are adopted through propitiation. Another way of saying it is I'm a child of God by adoption through propitiation. That is, for what my big brother did, Jesus, what he did, he came and he died on the cross and paid for my sins that I might be reconciled to the Father. And now I'm adopted. Does that sound familiar? How about the prodigal son? What that big brother did not do was go get his little brother. And he was such, when the little brother did come home and the dad was fawning over him and loved him, is the big brother sat outside on the porch pouting. That is not who Jesus was and that's not who he wants us to be. He wants us to go out and go find our little brother, our little sister, and bring them home. That's what Jesus did. Jesus is the antithesis of that big brother in that story. Yeah, we, we like to, when we, when we read that story, we like to put ourselves in the place of the prodigal son. And, and, and in a sense, we are until we get saved, right? <clears throat> but for the rest of our Christian life, who are we? We're the big brother. Go and tell somebody about Jesus who has died on the cross and paid for their sins. And all they got to do is look to him, and, right? All ye of the earth, be ye saved. Okay, all right. I'm going to come back to that drum in a minute, though. So go ahead. Now I'm going to show you an intriguing slide, and I think I got this and animated right. Is you and I, we see ourselves as we're reading the Bible, as we're trying to love the Lord, is we see, we have ourselves, as we have an identity. And then Jehovah intervenes. And, and at first we see ourselves as a rebel. 
somebody, Jesus says, oh yeah, you guys, uh, you see yourselves, uh, uh, you're concerned about these Galileans, but I'm telling you, you're a bunch of sinners too, and unless you repent, you're going to perish just like those Galileans did. And so he, oh, oh don't be too far ahead of me. And then he, then he pardons us of our sins. It's, it's, uh, there are scriptures, a bunch of scriptures. I mean, I just forgot what, what verse I was going to refer to there. Oh yeah, Ephesians 1, 7. In him that is in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins at the, according to the riches of his grace. And then when he pardons us, then we can begin to look at ourselves instead of a rebel who's waiting a death penalty. We see ourselves as a subject of the king or a servant of our master. And so then, uh, I mentioned before, you know, that even all the New Testament writers consider them, they refer to themselves as a servant of Jesus. And that's okay. All right, next. And as he has saved us and we become his subjects, he accepts us. Remember from, uh, from Ephesians uh, 1.6, is, this, is that he made us accepted in the beloved. That is in Christ, I'm accepted. All right, next. And then as I'm accepted in the beloved, Jesus, when he's sitting there, whether, I don't know where, exactly what, what the posture was at the time, but at some point that night that before he was to be crucified, he's talking to his disciples and he says, you call me master, you, you, uh, uh, I, but he says, I no longer call you servants. Listen to me. In John 15, 15, I no longer call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master does. But I have called you friends, for everything that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. See what Jesus is doing? He says, Up the, uh, yeah, I'm no longer calling you servants, but now I'm calling you friends. You see that? All right? And then what happens, or the next thing to consider, all this is happening, you know, when you get saved, this just happens. But we got to go back and look at it and see, wow, let's look at that again in slow motion. And that's kind of what we're doing here. Is the Lord adopts us. As the Holy Spirit is referred to as the spirit of adoption in Romans 8. And we just read Galatians, these verses out of Galatians 4. We could read about uh, uh, chosen before the foundation of the world, and then he adopts us in Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. That this, this has been a, a, a forever appointment that we were going to be adopted by the Father, we find out by reading Ephesians chapter 1. It is absolutely amazing. And then when he adopts us, who do we become? His child. His child. His child. And, and now let's look at the next, oh, it should be 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Is All this has happened. Then we're going to come to the Lord's table here today. As I want you to think of, you're coming to your daddy's table. This is a family meal, so to speak. All right. And so John, 1 John, this is the, the first epistle, is consider. He said, just think about this. How much love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. Amen. He said, this is so amazing now that therefore the world, that is everybody else, does not know us because it did not know Him. Next, on to verse 2. Beloved, John is saying to all, of, all the people of his reading, he's saying it to us today, Beloved, now... Now are we children of God. Stop thinking of yourself as a rebel and as a servant and a slave and all the kind of... Yes, all of those, but only in context. Is when you get down on your knees, when you're driving down the road and you're calling out to the Lord, you're calling out to Him as His child, His little boy, His little girl. I still have this picture of people running around in heaven as five-year-olds. <laughs> now we are children of God listen now and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be let that one just soak in is that you and I not only do we have a hard time imagining what heaven can be but we have, it has not been shown to us what we're going to be is that whatever we're going to be, it's going to be bigger, better, faster than the angels. 
Right? It says in, 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 in the New Testament that we shall judge angels. What does that mean? That somehow we're going to be senior to them. That's quite a promotion, huh? Is, is it, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. Is it you, my friend, what, what you're trapped in this body or you know, not much hair or not as good looking as you wish you were or not as strong or not as healthy as you used to be is, is all that's going to be swept away. And it's going to be something wonderful. And then he says, but, this is what, there's a big but here. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. What? Uh, just, just think about that when you're feeling like you're such a loser. Or you're caught up in sin, or you don't know what to say to your child. The, the moment when you know, God want to say something, or you're your spouse, or love, any loved one. Oh, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Someday. That's why they call it heaven. It's not just going to be a pleasant feeling. We're going to be with Jesus and we're going to be like him. Now, I'm, I don't want to go too far with that because it get a little bit irreverent up here, right? And we don't want that. We want to revere our Lord Jesus. <clears throat> but someday, and it, but rest assured, anybody has got the big ego, it, you ain't that way yet. You don't have that yet. Is you're a long way from that. Now, I don't know everybody intimately here, but I'm pretty sure you <clears throat> Not too different from me. We shall be like him. Oh. And then the next one. Is there's the we go from rebel, he pardons the rebel, makes us his subject. He accepts us in Christ as a friend. He adopts us as his child. That's your identity that you relate to your Lord. <coughs> Mon and Cameo and Bill were baptized recently. Is they have been following Jesus, professing Christians for quite some time before they did. <clears throat> uh, they were all ready, but the, the idea is is that when we take somebody in the baptistry, I see them. You see, they're already a child of God, and they're just saying, "Yes, I'm taking on the family last name." I want to be like my big brother Jesus. I want, I want the image of Christ to be formed in me by the grace of God. Okay, next. And of course, as we've said, since the Father's Day, you only have a little time and then this picture. And I want to look at that. This is, folks, time is running short. Uh, we're, all getting, we're not getting any younger. We're getting older. I want to tell you a quick story. I just got, I got hasty permission from... Somebody here a few minutes ago, I'll reveal it to you in a moment. We'll figure it out. But the difference between a, a, a natural son and an adopted son, or a natural daughter and an adopted daughter, is uh, when I came to Broadway, one of the people that I treasured, that I respected a lot, was Miss Lucy Rouse. And I knew that Miss Lucy was, she was no extrovert. She was an introvert. I know she wasn't perfect, but she was, she was precious to me. She was, she, you know, I never caught her sinning, <laughs> kind of thing. But I do remember her one time, and I, I learned not long after I got here is that Larry's firstborn, and Steve was adopted, and Steve was adopted much later, and uh, and then later on, George and Lucy had another baby named Tim. So he has a natural little brother, quite a bit younger, and then in between is Steve. And Steve, like a lot of kids who get adopted, who don't get born into a forever you know, a family with real mom and dad, is they have some identity issues. And Miss Lucy observed to me one time when I was over at her house talking to her about, about uh, her adopted son being in some kind of trouble. I don't remember what it was, and not important. But uh, she said uh, uh, something about, yeah. Uh, uh, and, uh, and we're talking about uh, something about adoption. 
about how sometimes it's tough having a, a, to raise an adopted child. And he said, yeah, sometimes it takes a lot more love. Words to that effect. I remember the exact words. And I, did, I, I didn't write those words down for today's sermon, and it's been a long time ago that she said it. But, but, but that picture right there, you know, posted that on the Internet? <laughs> Steve Rouse, that adopted son, posted that. And Larry reminded me this morning that George and Lucy used to take in guy, uh, kids a lot and father and mother those kids. And uh, so Larry's kind of had this example being played out before him. And uh, so good, that's good advice for us too. And we, we have to come back to that Steve... Well, Miss Lucy said that sometimes you got to love your adopted kids more or it takes more kind of thing, is that's the way the Lord views us as his adopted kids, is sometimes it takes a lot of love to get them to the next step or the next grade or the next, through this emergency to emerge out on the other end uh, from, from failure to success and all those kind of things, is stop looking at yourself as being a failure or, or that that God has given up on me or and those kind of things, right? Is that you have a future and a hope. His name is Jesus. I remember adoption through propitiation. Now we come back to reminding ourselves and those who never what that crazy big word is. What is propitiation? Is propitiation is what happens to our God as our judge, our ruler, our creator, the lawgiver who has been offended and ignored and rebelled against is when Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. Propitiation is, is he, he absorbs all of our, the punishment for all of our sin on the cross. At the same time that, that God, the, the lawgiver, Jehovah, the lawgiver is satisfied is, uh, what's the word, uh, well, I guess satisfied, is that justice is satisfied so that the door is now open, that we're no longer considered rebels, but friends, nay, even better, child of God. That's what happened on the cross. And that's what we celebrate when we come to this table. It's always come to the table remembering that you're a child daughter of the king, you're a son of the king. When we say king, we mean king with a capital K. It is not some knucklehead in a castle somewhere. We're talking about the ruler of the universe, the creator, redeemer, sustainer, friend, all those words that Steve used. And most importantly, our heavenly father. And so, Steve, if you would come forward. And those who are going to distribute the elements, come forward. And we invite you, if you're a believer in Christ, you're a follower of him. <clears throat> we don't ask you for your baptism certificate or pedigree. We, you stand before God yourself and give account of uh, all the deeds done in the body. Is uh, You're welcome to come to the Lord's table if you belong to Jesus. <clears throat> and to celebrate the, that moment with us. Celebrate it in joy, but also observe it soberly in the sense that, that we submit ourselves to the Lord and say, Lord, is there more? Am I living my life in such a way? Not that I'm expecting to be perfect, but am I, is the direction such that you're pleased with me? What kind of changes would you ask of me? It's necessary for me to take the next step of intimacy with you, to let you love me more wonderfully even than before. And so, after the supper, Jesus took that cup. And so, Father, uh, we, today, we receive the cup. Lord, thank you, Father, for the precious blood of Jesus that we might be your children. In Jesus' name, amen. Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away. 
slain for us. And we remember the promise made that all who come in faith find forgiveness at the cross. So we share in this bread of life and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of peace around the table of the King. The body of our Savior Jesus Christ torn for you. Eat and remember the wounds that heal the death that brings us life. Pay the price to make so we share in this bread of life, and we drink of this sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of peace around the table of the King. The blood that cleanses every stain of sin shed for so we don't take the risk of people having to handle the cup and a piece of bread at the same time. We'll go ahead and observe the cup first, okay? Mm -hmm. It says that when he took that bread, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, I'm sorry, after he took the same matter, he took the cup. He says, this cup is the new covenant given in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of Your Heavenly Father, please forgive me for messing this up. I know this. And with that, oh Heavenly Father, the body of Christ, the body of our Lord, as you said in the Old Testament, you have given me a body. So Father, we commemorate and we rejoice that you loved us so much that your Son, your son from eternity came into this world in flesh and blood and came and paid that awful price. And yes, in that body, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch my need.
things than when we first began. When Jesus had taken the bread, he broke it. And with giving thanks, he says, he told his disciples, take, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And Paul ends that section by saying, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, the question that that concludes our, the, what we call a, uh, an ordinance. Some would call it a ritual or a ceremony. Uh, what we want to communicate here, or I want to ask you a question, is, is, is this Lord's Supper, is it recommended to do this? this? To thank Him, to commemorate just when we have Lord's Supper? Or do we do it every time we consume something? I would encourage you to thank Him for his death and burial and resurrection every time you eat something. That would include a Dr. Pepper. Whatever you, whatever you do. Now, we're not going to remember that, are we? But, uh, but the idea of thanking God for when we consume something is that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen. Is, is we're talking about the word that proceeded out of the mouth of God here. Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins. He, he, came, he came forth from God, born of a woman. And so, if somebody asks you, are you a child of God? And you say yes. And you do it with enthusiasm. And every day, and on, on your worst night of discouragement, out of money, out of love, out of friends, out of whatever you're out of, Yes, Lord. I'm glad you still love me. Amen. Scripture says, even if my mama and father give them up on me, I know that you are to look, will look out for me. And with that, uh, would you please stand? A note, an admin note as we're leaving, also as an act of worship, is uh, Larry's going to have a, an offering plate there if you'd like to get donate. Again, this is strictly voluntary as all of our offerings are, but um, our regular offering is in the box on the right in the back as you go out. And I'll try not to stand in front of it and block you from getting to it. <laughs> and also, uh, but that, uh, that uh, offering plate that it has is for, for anyone who would like to give for people who could use some help in, in financial difficulty. And we try to spend it very wisely and carefully and frugally. Um, and uh, it's not just one person's decision. We, we, uh, we, we coordinate it and make sure we're in agreement before we do anything like that. So we, but we do help people who are in need of uh, what we call benevolence. And with that, uh, Brother Steve. Amen. Please join with us. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you. bless your family as you serve the King of Kings. God bless you this week. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them at the impulse of thy love, take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing, always only for the King. Take my lips and let them be filled with mercy. My silver and my gold.
not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as you choose. Here am I. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thy own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour. At your feet, its treasure store. Take myself, and I will be. Take my moments and my 